Good day, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. K coming at you from London, and we've got Gil Morales over in Playa del Rey. And uh, yeah, let's get right to it. Um, as uh, we wrote in today's pre-market pulse, the markets are baby stepping higher. Uh, essentially, what's interesting is if you look at the setback in uh, Euroland, and if we look at the IEV, which is the iShares uh, Europe 350, which tracks uh, some of the bigger companies in Europe. Uh, they had that scare with Spain, and, and it pulled back. But if you look at uh, the Nasdaq and you look at the S and P, you'll see that uh, there was minimal pullback, and then these averages just went right back up to new highs. And the reason being is we've got Q Eternity, and that uh, link I sent to everyone this morning in the pre-market pulse, it shows graphically at the top of the article the levels of QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, and QE3. Call, let's call it QE3 just for simplicity. Um, and you'll see, therefore, that on that graph, Operation Twist was uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of plus minus, basically, you have the zero point, and the Operation Twist was inconsistent, and the markets rallied on the Operation Twist, but not as fast and hard as they did with QE1 and QE2 which were far pure. And now we're back to QE eternity, and it looks, therefore, that uh, the markets will get pushed higher like they have before. Um, and of course, we'll probably get more fireworks out of Europe, but like before, uh, that will recover and the U.S. markets will recover. The issue will then become, when is the Fed going to, uh, going to uh, slow Q eternity? And really comes back to what they said, if the unemployment rate remains above 6.5 percent, they're going to continue their QE program in full. So uh, I think the markets are going to be obviously paying very close attention to any Fed action, Fed words um, regarding QE going forward. But right now QE is fully on. It's fully on in the U.S. Um, the Bank of England and the ECB also are doing their forms of QE. And therefore this uptrend that started is, if history's any guide, is probably going to continue in its uptrend. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think we'll go, go uh, over some of the more controversial stocks today because everybody's always interested in that. I mean, yesterday we got questions about cores and it was coming in after the Bible gap up, but it's held uh, you know two percent above the or rather above the two percent porosity level, which would have been about uh, what were you saying, Dr. Like sixty ninety. That's taken sixty one twenty two plus two percent and adding a dime or so to it. Is that basically what you're doing on that one? Well, you, you're talking about the the low, you know. If you yeah, used to... when you were putting out, you put out those uh, stop levels on the stock the other day, just to give everybody an idea of what we're looking at. Yeah, so if you're doing two percent, then that's where you know two percent's wherever wherever right. it's at. Right, and you haven't really gotten there, but you know, I I think this stock's going higher, so it's really a question of whether it was going to pull in, and pull a maneuver like uh, NSM and fill the gap, and then turn around and go higher. And what I love about NSM is it comes out of this with no. Uh, pocket pivot volume, but it, it did dry up. Look at the extreme dry up in the volume here as it pulled down to the 10 day. And I thought that was a, a reasonable place to nibble on shares, although, you know, the way this thing acts, it makes me nervous uh, because I thought coming down here, this is a reasonable spot to nibble on shares. And again, here and then again in here it was, but that, that actually ended up working. Uh, but you have the breakout, and so that's viable just on that basis alone. The stock has moved higher since we pointed out. The uh, breakout on a pocket pivot volume is 35% above average volume, but it, you know normally uh, if you're using strict O'Neill rules, you'd like to see 50% uh, above volume, uh, average volume on a breakout. But as we know, a pocket pivot volume signature is usually sufficient for a breakout. And in these types of markets, it seems like a lot of times you do get that happening where you don't necessarily have uh, a big uh, volume breakout. The stock just uh, comes out. A lighter volume or on a pocket pivot volume signature and fakes everyone out and then you see the volume come in later. So that's viable to announce earnings next Wednesday. Uh, obviously the big story and everybody's uh, asking us about, oh you know I did want to go back over course. I had an email from somebody and they were wigging out and they asked me, you know, what do you make of course? You know, I bought the stock uh, before earnings on the pocket pivot and then I added on the Bible and I thought okay that makes sense. If you're following the rules that's basically what you do. You buy an initial position on the uh, 
pocket pivot down in here, and then you add on the viable gap up. And then he made a statement that I thought was very interesting. He says, this is potentially a life-changing trade for me. And I thought about that, and I would say to anybody, the last thing you ever want to, to have uh, is your trading, uh, any trade you make, be a life-changing trade. Because I'd like to know, first of all, how do you know that ahead of time? Dr. K, are you able to determine uh, when you have a, quote, life-changing trade uh, before you make the trade or at the exact moment that you do make the trade? I guess it all is about where that epiphany comes, the eureka moment, right? <laughs> I suppose, I mean, we know, like you used to say back in the late 90s, you know, the opportunity of a lifetime can come every other week. And I think that always holds true in the markets, uh, more or less. Uh, but you don't know which one is, and you should never approach a trade with the idea that it's the life-changing trade. I thought maybe this person had allocated way too much to the trade and wasn't really psychologically prepared to deal with it because if somebody's wigging about it as either coming in and blowing up on a pullback that looks relatively normal or thinking ahead of time that this is a life-changing trade, you know, in the context in which he made that statement, um, you know, obviously uh, he's really got to do some inner work and some self-examination because that's, yeah. that's a statement to make. But if it if it's coming at, I mean, obviously if someone can get an epiphany, regardless of you know the reason, if a trade gave them the epiphany, that's great because then they can uh, utilize that and maybe yeah, maybe and, and so. We get a lot of emails from people, you know, asking about this stock and that stock when they start to come in and, you know, what do I do and, oh, my God, and I'm worried and I'm scared. And, and it's like, okay, if you're allocating correctly and you're psychologically suited to dealing with the volatility that you're going to experience based on the position size. So, in other words, I, you know, I'll take 30, 50 percent positions, but I'm ready to sit through the volatility that that entails. And if you find yourself wigging about something, you know, just check yourself and you use a mirror and, and look at what you're thinking and saying to yourself as you're trading and I think that can ward off danger ahead of time so I think when you see people or hear people making those sorts of statements I'm worried about this stock you know what are your thoughts and people email us when something starts coming down they'll email us and there's this uh, expression of nervousness as if somehow we're supposed to play psychi uh, you know couch uh, psychi psychiatrist and and uh, calm them down, but you can only calm yourself down by sizing your positions properly and then sticking to your rules and trying not to let the noise and the fluctuations that you see uh, throw you off. There's a great IBD article on a good friend of ours, Mike Scott. He was in there a couple days ago. I think it was yesterday's paper or the day before's paper, I forget, but it's an investor profile. I think Mike's also in that new book that Amy uh, put out, you know, all good friends of ours. and. Uh, Mike actually helped us uh, configure our e-signal charts back when we did the first book, and we actually mentioned Mike in there. But you know, he talks about how he doesn't even look at daily charts anymore. He looks at weekly charts, and you might consider that uh, as a, a method of uh, investing to uh, take your take the noise out of the picture. You know, you're looking at five-minute charts. I use them when I'm shorting. I don't use them on the long side because basically, when you're buying positions, you want to take them. Uh, stick to your stops and just sit with the position. So we'll get questions about LinkedIn. Yesterday somebody asked us, how do you handle a stock like LinkedIn? And when you look at this pattern, well, there's not too much to handle. Let's say if you had bought in here on this breakout pocket pivot maneuver here uh, up through the 115 level, gapped up, and you had a position going into earnings, okay, and then so you let's say you had 10% here, and then it gaps up again, yet another 10%. Okay, what, how do you handle it? Um, I, I don't really know what the heck that means. How do you handle it? I guess you just hold it. You know, there's nothing really to think about at this point. There will be a pullback at some point, and hopefully there will be a third buy point. Now, if you entered the stock for the first time on the viable gap up, which I think is entirely viable, given the fact that uh, let's let's take a look at this on a weekly chart. Uh, if you look at LinkedIn on a weekly chart, let's make these bars a little bit fatter. There we go. And it's just coming out. The line of least resistance has been broken, okay? And so this thing is probably heading higher. I'm going to guess it's headed for 200 unless we run into some serious issues with the, uh, with the market. And so I would not be fretting too much about this if I owned it anywhere on the viable gap update or if I bought an initial position down here and then added on the viable gap up. You're sitting pretty. What, what is there to think? What is there to handle? Not much. Now, on the other hand, if you have a stock like Triple D, uh, you know, to say how would you handle this, uh, I think what you've got going on is the stock's had a sharp move and now you're seeing this slamming to the downside as, it's, as it shakes out weaker hands. You had a report from uh, Citron Research yesterday 
uh, talking about how it's a bubble stock, and, and I, I, I'm reminded of uh, comments people used to make about um, Netflix when, uh, you know, back in the day when, what, what was that, uh, Dutch K, when that guy, Nunzio, or N whatever the guy's name was, was out there uh, slamming the stock on right, uh, CNBC, you know. And I think that was back when Netflix was, let's go way back, because Netflix was, I think that was, that, that may have caused one of these pullbacks in here, and the stock just went higher, uh, you know, another 100 points higher. So I think when you hear people talking about something being a bubble stock, uh, it'd be a little wary of that, but I would say, um, I love the way my e-signal likes to like suddenly freeze up on me. Uh, the stock's selling at 40 times forward estimates. So Apple, when it began its run, as we pointed out in this morning's pre-market pulse, was at 46 times earnings. And so I don't really see the bubble when you have uh, material growth in earnings and sales where you have accelerating earnings. Uh, I think, let's see, let's look at the last uh, several quarters on the stock. And you're going 47, 42, 78 over the last three quarters after a negative 20% four quarters ago. Next quarter, uh, which is going to be announced next week, 138%. Sales were up uh, 63, 52, 57, and you have peak quarterly after-tax margins of 20%. Sponsorship is at 245, which is up pretty strongly from the prior quarter. And I've seen uh, some some big smart funds uh, moving into the stock. And, and I think what you're getting now with this report, people are a little bit late to the uh, party here in terms of uh, selling today, so they're taking it down to the 50-day moving average. And we'll just have to see whether the stock holds the line. Uh, or not, and on that basis, uh, that's basically what you're watching for. But you know, you haven't had any new buy points. It's looking a little bit funky on the weekly chart, but it may just need to settle down. It's being subject to a lot of news, and so we'll just watch and see what happens here. But if you own the stock from down lower, then you're watching a violation of the 50-day moving average as your selling guide. Uh, if you own it up in here, and there were no buy points up in here, this we did not mention this viable gap up because it was coming on the heels of, of this one, which was actionable. Um, and so it's not, it's really not, there's not anything that you can discern here. You may try and step in at the 50 day if it gets there, but you might note that it's at the 10 week line. The blue moving average here on the weekly chart is a 10 week line. You may notice that that is the case um, there. So, you know, if that's what you want to do. Because you've got two, two weeks of heavy volume, but I've seen stocks get hit with a couple weeks of heavy volume and then they, settle down and then they uh, set up and go again. So you just have to see how this thing handles itself. Let's see, the other one, uh, PRLB, we get a lot of questions about this one. Uh, this one coming in, I think you you know you can try nibbling in here. It may come and fill the gap, take you down to 43.55, maybe. But this is very difficult, a thin stock, jacks like this, and you know, someone said they bought it at 48. Okay, you're in a reasonable spot here. You're only down a little over a buck, couple, three percent. So that's pretty reasonable. That's not really entirely out of line, I don't think. And uh, you know, it's holding actually above what is that low 46.70 right now. So it's trying to hold that. It's, it reminds me a little bit of Coors on that, but it is a thinner stock. It trades 300 and something thousand shares a day, so it is a thinner stock, and you can expect it to slide around more. Um, Triple D, we already know is volatile stock, and some of the pullbacks it pulls, uh, you know, what it gets away with. Whoops. Uh, sometimes amaze me, and we've had sharp pullbacks in the stock, but I, I think it's still viable, and I think uh, I would be watching here for a nice place to enter uh, a position on this pullback. So, um, let's see what else we got going on. Uh, <clears throat> why don't we go with some questions? Let's see. Uh, we talked about PRLB and cores. Core's good buy point. Um, well, it pulled back into the lows here, so that was really where you could have picked it up. It's still within range of its viable gap up, so it's within the buy point. So VRX uh, violated the 10-day moving average this morning. So we actually had a position in this, bought somewhere down here, and we sold it. We actually sold it two days ago because you could start to see it uh, sort of wobbling a bit, and you were making new highs on light volume, which I thought was cautionary. Uh, but, you know, that's a decent profit you can take now and see what happens after earnings. But for the most part, you know, that's violated its 10-day moving average. C 
CHD, Church and Dwight, this is not really a stock that we follow. Do you follow this one, Dr. K? No. No. I mean, good earnings growth. I think what's the earnings growth in the most recent quarter? 30%. You're accelerating sales up 11%. It looks like the type of stock that you're more defensive than anything, yeah. but uh, it's, it's acting well. okay. Yeah, it seems, well yeah, it, right? it seems to obey the 50-day pretty well. I mean, it could be, you know, some some investors, it's a good stock. It, it could fit their uh, risk appetite. Although I don't yeah, like the earnings line on my thing. It shows uh, deceleration, so I, I wouldn't be really keen on that. I'm showing up 22% uh, quarter before in this most recent quarter, up 30 on Church and Dwight. And next and quarter, be, up 9. That must be, uh, oh, is that first call? I use first call. Okay. Because I worked at O'Neill and I know all the funky inaccuracies in the earnings data, so don't trust it. Yeah, I should probably. Uh, all right, yeah, this is probably. This is quite a difference because it shows minus 2%, 22%, to 9%. So I'll just switch over to first. Yeah, but it's still you know slow. But these are the types of stocks that have been working. It seems like a lot of stocks are moving higher in this market, and uh, that seems to be constructive. So there's really nothing, you know. Unconstructive about the whole situation. CBLT, Commvault, uh, we've had a position in this one. It's just, you know, you had this addition to the SP Midcap 400 three days ago, so you see the big block go off towards the end of the day at the close, and technically that's a pocket pivot, and the stock's just hanging out, so there's really nothing going on there other than the fact it's just going, it's going sideways. So, Rax, what should I have seen in the stock's action before it crashed? Well, uh, first of all, you should have seen the 10-day moving average violation here. So that that was basically your first uh, warning sign. And and then uh, after that, you even have a minor violation of the 50-day moving average here. But this really was it here because you were following the uh, seven-week rule once from this pocket pivot here. It never violated. So uh, we were using the 10-day on that one and violated there. That's what you should have seen. Opine on the A and R chart. What is A and R? Probably some uh, coal stock. Not anything really to see here. That's what it looks like. Don't wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole. EVR. What is this? Evergreen. Evercore, rather. Yeah, I think an Evergreen partner is another. Used to be a client of ours back at O'Neill. Um, Evercore partners. A uh, little pocket pivot action here. I think this is just an uh, investment. Uh, Banker broker uh, provides advisory services to multinational corporations on mergers. Uh, has been acting well, and you have a pocket pivot there, so that might be a spot to add uh, to a position. And earnings were up 153 percent. This is, you know, Warren Buffett. Uh, his group bought uh, Heinz the other day, and he's talking about how it's a ripe environment for mergers, and you know, maybe these guys are getting a lot of uh, nice business. Uh, thrown their way because they do advise on that. So um, DGI, you know, we've talked about this before. There's really not too much here. You had support at the 50-day moving average, which looks fine, and that's what it looks like on the weekly chart. If it closes out like this today, uh, you have a pickup in volume, so definitely support off of the 10-week uh, moving average, and so that looks okay. I don't really see any issues with that uh, on the weekly chart, and it's just working its way higher. you got earnings next week, I believe. So. For LinkedIn, when does the seven-week rule start, Dr. K? Everybody wants to know. Uh, let's have a look. So we've got your pockets pivot on January 10th. That's a pretty classic one. And then you start counting. One, two, three, four. Now you have a Bible gap up, so that resets it. So you start counting now. We're in the first week. Well, we're, we're just starting this the, uh, the sixth day. Um, of the of the new count. So if LinkedIn can obey the ten week uh, the ten day moving average for seven weeks, then you're going to use the ten day moving average as your selling guide. Yeah, and I guess right now what is what is your selling guide? This one forty thirteen low over here. Uh, uh, right now that's correct. Yeah, the one forty thirteen low, and be, so it's also way, because way it's uh, it's. Right now, it's on the verge. If it goes goes up, maybe one more day higher. If it goes, if it retraces all the way back down to that low of one forty point one three, um, I wouldn't give it any porosity. I would just, I would sell it. Yeah, like, but I don't think it's going to. I don't think it's going to. This is one of those that doesn't look back. I'll, I'll bet you it just sets up in a tight flag up here somewhere, 
and that would be your uh, next buy point. Somebody's asking when, where do you add? Well, you, you, you add in the next buy point, and right now it's just extended and way above any point uh, to add. So, and I know that the psychological uh, knee jerk reaction is when they're going up, you never own enough, and when they're going down, you own too much. So, uh, you got to resist the feeling that, oh my God, this thing's going up, and I only have a 10 or 20 percent position. There'll be another buy point. If this thing's going to double, there will be other buy points and you'll have other opportunities to buy. Just be patient and let it work for you. I mean, I, I can tell you, I think that if you try to force things and, and uh, push too hard, sometimes you'll end up getting yourself in trouble in this market. You kind of have to take a st slow and steady and deliberate approach using and sticking to uh, your buy rules So, and your, sell your selling rules. So that's basically how we operate with this. Is buy uh, BII B's move today viable? I don't understand why it would be. It's extended from the 10 day. It was a buy. We thought it was okay on this uh, pocket pivot, and we did get, uh, or not a pocket pivot, a buyable gap up here, and the stock did pull in a little bit, but you know, a little bit of porosity, no, no problem there, and turn around and go. Biogen is a biotech, so it tends to be a little more volatile than your uh, average bear, so you give it 2%. Celtine's another biotech that always comes up. It's not really too much to think about. If you look at it on a weekly chart, you're just going sideways. This is kind of what I think LinkedIn will do. You know, this has had a big breakout, and this is actually a breakout, I think, to all-time highs for Celgene. And now it's just going in a tight flag. So it's a long 10-day moving average. It's had a couple of pocket pivots. You got one here. I'm not, I don't think this one quite made it. Maybe it did. I don't know. But either way, the thing is still moving tight sideways. And that's a sharp upside move uh, of about 20% from here. So. I think that you probably would, would uh, just want to sit with this until you see another buy point, although I think you probably could add a little bit in here. Now, the other thing that comes up is, does this bring into play the Livermore uh, century mark rule? And I would say that it can, but Celgene isn't really you know the biggest, hottest stock on the planet, so you're not, um, you know, you're probably not going to see it rocket from here, although, you know, so far it has rocketed pretty fast for a boring old biotech, but uh, I think at this point it's just acting fine. Looks fine. Um, good article on IBD yesterday about ramping up production. Was the reversal recently bad? Oh, is that INDN? Well, we didn't like care much for this reversal. You know, you, this thing was looking fine. You had a pocket pivot, and we explained in our uh, pre-market pulse why we thought uh, it was probably running up to begin with and why it was pulling back. And it seems to me that uh, there's some anticipation that Apple is going to announce this iWatch. And I think if they did, uh, I believe in Vincent's uh, motion sensor chips are smaller and more power efficient. And so that uh, makes them a likely candidate. Now, if you read the article, it's pretty interesting because it did say that they're, they've been asked by a, a new large customer to double their capacity and that would seem to argue that uh, Apple is going to come on as a client now for a customer but you know you don't I don't really care much for the way this is acting it probably just needs more time uh, to go sideways and, and set up again and maybe there will be another uh, some announcement AVY I don't even know what this is, is that Avery Dennison I'm trying to remember yeah office supplies. I, um, another example of a stock just steadily moving up. I guess this is a viable gap up, but not the type of stock we'd normally look for uh, a viable gap up to occur. And so, you know, looks fine though. Nothing really happening here. Is there a pocket pivot? This, you're extended from the 10-day moving average, so it's a little bit up there. OII. Oh boy. Oil services, isn't it? Uh, Oceaneering International, they're in uh, oil and gas field services, right? So you get this reversal pocket pivot, and would you buy that, Dr. K? Well, you know, the earnings and the sales are accelerating. Uh, institutional sponsorship has been up last three quarters, and I do like when uh, on an earnings um, there's a tug of war and then the, the bulls win. So, you know, it's it's an oil stock. It's the only thing that I have a reservation about because these oil stocks, if you look at this weekly, this on the weekly chart, you'll see what I mean. It's pretty sloppy. Um, yeah. Oil stocks rarely have coherent patterns. Uh, there are times like 1997 and then um, earlier in this decade there, were some, there was some coherence, but 
outside of that, they tend to trade quite sloppy and tend to not only disobey the 50-day, but also the 200-day, which makes them quite hard to hold. So I'd, yeah. I'd pass on this one. Yeah, but it does look that maneuver looks a lot like uh, home loan uh, servicing solutions here, which had this nice yank similar to it, but it got supported the 50-day moving average. This one did the same thing. But if you really like oil stocks, then you got a pocket pip pivot there. So somebody says, so we are in the first week of the seven-week rule as BGU resets the count. And I guess that's what Dr. K said. Does a stock like SS Centaurus, um, it's kind of thin and cheap, so it doesn't really, I mean, it's, it's acting reasonably okay. Uh, stock's just been trending higher. Here's like a little pocket pivot right there off the 10-day moving average, but it's not really going anywhere. So, you know, looks... Uh, Looks interesting, I think, um, but next quarter's earnings are going to be one penny, negative 66% earnings growth. So that kind of, you know, puts a kibosh on that. So, anyways, let's see. Does a century mark rule also apply to the averages with the debt? No. I mean, you know, read reminiscences of a stock operator. What does Livermore say? Um, What percentage of your overall profits were made? I have no idea. From shorting in 2012, I have no idea. I don't, I don't even worry about it. Do you give any weight to the O'Neill sponsorship rating? Eh, to some extent. I mean, I, I can tell which funds are the smarter funds, and so I, I look for those. I think you know people like Contra Fund is pretty smart. Jeff Vinnick is pretty smart. Uh, Calamos Management used to be another firm that we considered pretty smart. Um, and I have to look at some of the other ones that I think are smart. I just kind of look at who's in, in the stock and who's been buying and adding. Do you recommend limiting your number of stocks to hold at five or six to prevent diluting portfolio returns? Well, that's what O'Neill recommends, and I kind of operate that way. I usually go to two or three or four, so I think it depends on how much money you have. Dr. K likes to go to more than that, so it's really a matter of preference. You want to pontificate on that, Dr. K? Sorry, you were blanking out. Go one more time. Somebody's asking, do you recommend limiting the number of stocks to hold at five or six to prevent diluting portfolio returns? Yeah, it depends on your, your trading style. I mean, some people prefer more, some people even less. So you have to find what works for you and know that you, know, you're, you have your risk tolerance levels. Know that if you're concentrated in, say, five positions and you're fully on margin and one of those gaps down, uh, what it's going to do to your portfolio and if it's, that's something that's okay. Uh, some people like to also psychologically get on board all the names. They like to kiss as many babies as possible. So in that case, um, you know, having a portfolio of, of 10, 12, 14 stocks is fine as long as you can track them all, as long as it, it's manageable. Um, otherwise, it's going to obviously impact your performance again. So you have to find a, um, a medium that works well for your, the way your mind, mindset works. Yeah, I mean, it's not really so much an issue of diluting portfolio returns because the fewer stocks you hold, the more volatile your portfolio is likely going to be. So the question is, you know, can you handle the increased volatility from that? Uh, Alexion is uh, a stock I've been looking at. I uh, was shorting it yesterday and undercut this low here, so that was a cover on that on the short term. It's breaking down from a head and shoulders formation, yes. And I know that Contra Fund has been a big uh, axe in the stock, and they've been exiting the stock recently. So to me, this looks like you know you're breaking down uh, through the neckline, which I guess you could just say is a flat neckline, and uh, you could probably try and short it. It looks like 90, because uh, I noticed yesterday it, it rallied back in today right up to 90. So it looks like 90 is your uh, resistance level short term. So if it can't get back above 90, it's shortable. But then that comes down to, you know, are you in a bear market or a bull market and where, where are your best prospects going to be, I think, on the long side. It seems like most short sales that I've tried, you get a little bit of movement on them temporarily and then they reverse on you and, and don't really go anywhere. I think if we went into a market correction, you might see this break. And of course that brings up Apple. But Apple's just trying to hang out at its 10-day moving average. Volume is drying up. So I got to think, you know, there was a news item out yesterday talking about how um, everybody's, all these hedge fund managers and, and whatnot, Cooperman, some Cooperman guy, I don't even know who that is. Um, I guess I'm just not, I don't watch enough CNBC, but 
uh, that he sold all his positions. So all these hedge fund managers are out. There's like four or five that they listed that are out of the stock. So it's possible that, that it's all washed out in the near term. Uh, and you kind of have one, two, three waves down in the pattern. But, you know, I'm just kind of watching this. I think that if you saw a high volume break and the market started to roll over, then maybe you could come after this uh, on the short side. So I'm watching the, the 3D printing stocks, and, you know, they throw PRLB in there, although it's not really. But all of these got whacked yesterday on that Citron report. They seem to be stabilizing intraday, so I'm just kind of watching these. I like the idea of nibbling on these as they come in, just try to see if I can take a position in here and see where it goes and give it maybe a percent or two on the downside. So you're looking at probably like 46, uh, 70, uh, I'm sorry, 45, 70 is a downside stop on PRLB. And I notice, I think DDD is, uh, Triple D is, is just getting hit because of the Citron report. But again, like we said, we reject the idea that it's a bubble stock because what they are doing is disruptive. And uh, you know, had lunch with uh, uh, an investor client of ours uh, and he's a developer, and he was telling me how they use it for uh, building these uh, complex uh, architectural or highly detailed architectural models, which you can see that's a pretty uh, pretty good application. And someone else emailed us today that their son is in a business. I forget. Did you see that email? I'm trying to remember what it was, Dr. K, that somebody, their uh, son is uh, using it to build prototypes or they're using it for prototypes. So I, th I think it does... Uh, hmm. You know, you got to think when these architectural models, I'm sure people have seen them before, uh, they're, they're really neat looking, but they're built by model makers and they cost a lot of money, you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. You use a printer and you can make the whole thing for a fraction of the cost. And, and that is disruptive, uh, you know, on the industrial side. And I think it, people overemphasize the, uh, the, the home printing thing. I, I'm not sure that's ever going to catch on. You know, my son wants me to get one, but I don't think I'm going to get one. You know, I, he did, he's into Minecraft. That's a hot new game the kids are into, and he wants to print out his characters, but uh, I don't really see the point in that. His room is a minefield of uh, action characters, Legos, and other things all over the place that basically are uh, booby trapped the entire room. If you, if you walk into it, you're in danger of uh, getting something stuck in your foot, so we don't need more of that as far as I'm concerned. Thoughts on YY action? What is YY action? YY. Why, wow, that's uh, interesting. I mean, this hasn't even hit my radar. What does it trade like? Ten shares a day? Yep, just like that, about 192,000 a day. Uh, what are the thoughts to have? You're breaking out on a 509 percent increase in volume. So, looks interesting, losing money, but you know, I don't have any thoughts on it. But uh, technically, you got a breakout. So, if you think there's a good story here, um, you know, I guess you could buy it. Here's the top of the base, somewhere above 15. Yeah, it's double XIA. Chinese stock. So. Uh... You know, yeah. it's gonna, a lot of these Chinese stocks are just simply disappointed over the last few yeah. years, and they form good patterns, and then they don't, they don't do anything. But you could take a tiny position, just knowing it's your your money yeah. is at great risk. Uh, we look at the XXI, Ixi, I guess this one is, and uh, they came out with 33% earnings growth the last quarter. That was a few days ago, I think last week. Before that, earnings growth is 25%, and they're a networking stock, so that they seem to be acting okay. It's a smaller stock. Trades, as you can see, are 748,000 shares a day on average. You had a pocket pivot here. They came out with earnings stock dropped back, but it's moving back to new highs. So I don't know. Would you buy this on the basis of the pocket pivot, Dr. K? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it, it's a little thin. It's it's all right. I mean, it's got good numbers fundamentally. Um, you know, I've seen this one before, and it uh, right now seems like it's working okay. Um, it's it's not my favorite stock, um, but I, it, it's you know you could do a whole lot worse. If someone wants to buy a position on the basis of the pocket pivot, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yandex. Uh, whoops. I've been watching this thing go higher. I still I don't trust it because it's a Russian stock, but it may end up doing pretty well. You got any thoughts on this one, Dr. K? Yeah, I, you know, this is the one where um, it's, the, it's the potentially new Baidu and yeah. out of Russia. And the thing is that it tracks the RSX, which is the Russian ETF, and it tends to outperform the RSX. So if you believe the RSX, as a lot of these other countries are turning around, turning the corner and moving higher, then this uh, YNDX should outperform and should do pretty well. So it is viable. I mean, it normally would be. This is a pattern that I would call normally a bottom fishing pattern. But in this, in the context of which it's in, it is not a bottom fishing pattern. It just happens to track the RSX quite well. 
and I do believe with QE at the helm um, that that will that will bode well for uh, you know the, these emerging markets, which probably you know they tend to outperform um, the European and the U.S. markets when when we get into uptrends. Yeah. So it's just a matter of uh, you know seeing how it's low in its pattern, forming a cup. There's no real handle. I don't know if you call this a handle down in here. This is the weekly chart here. So it is trying to break out and clearing this uh, this cup base right now. But earnings come out next week, so I'm going to guess they're going to be pretty good. VMware. We've already discussed this as a short many times, and of course I thought it was shortable in here on this rally using the 80 level as your stop. So we've talked this about this many times in previous reports. And uh, you know, looks looks like it, it was a short back then. So if you're trying to short it now, you're a little bit late to the party because you've already dropped about 10% off of here. Maybe I think more than that. You went from about uh, 79. Well, no, that's not right. Yeah, a little less than 10%. So it, that was a short last week when we when I've been talking about it in these uh, webinars. Not a short now. Soon, Dr. K will be able to print a copy of his himself so he can be in London and fly that way at the same time. Uh, Okay. Yeah, we know I'm about this one. <laughs> we, I don't know. I don't think I can handle sitting with a, a plastic version of Dr. K. So, um, anyways, uh, Organova, I know about this stock. They're, uh, this company is developing technology to, uh, to uh, print uh, organs and stuff like that. And it's uh, pretty cool. Lope on the thin side, but IBD. Suggested in leaderboard. Um, yeah, it looks okay, I guess. Breaking out, yeah, 77 row. I don't know. It's a little bit slow. Don't really, never really have trusted this stock. And earnings growth in the last quarter, 41 percent. Sales up 23. It's it's starting to pick up. So it looks kind of interesting, but we'll see what happens here. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't really. It's kind of loose, so I, I don't really care for it. How about you, Dr. K? Uh, yeah, I've seen this one before, and it, it always gets my attention initially, and then I ultimately give it an A, just because it's uh, yeah, it's wide and loose, and it violates the 50 too often. Yeah. Uh, I thought you know I was looking at let's go some, over some more stocks. Looks like we ran out of questions. We have a large group here attending today, but we ran out of questions. Hertz, you know, we were talking about it as being a boring stock. Um. And uh, I guess it's not so boring. It's, it's moving along pretty nicely here. So it looks like that one. And uh, what was Avis? Is uh, what's the symbol on Avi Avis? Is Avi no? What is it? Help uh, me out, somebody. Avis. Good question. I haven't looked at that one in a while. But those, you know, those car. I think is what Avis car. is. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Those are both <laughs> acting the same. You know, and they're they're moving higher. And you guys ask, why is something like this moving up? Moving higher, it's very fascinating, actually. So, um, I guess we'll just have to see how these act. But you know, if you own them from down lower, uh, yeah. If you, if you own it from if you own it from forty cents um, on February twenty seventh, two thousand nine, <laughs> then you're doing pretty well. Yeah. It turned yeah it turned out to be a let's see a uh, yeah it's almost a hundred bagger <laughs> since then. Yeah. So, you know, just shows in this market the stocks you think aren't going to do well actually do. Let's see, uh, what else we got? OCN, uh, this is like, you know, all the other mortgage stocks that's waiting for earnings, I guess, next week. So it's hanging out. Nothing really major here going on. Uh, just uh, just biding its time after this breakout here. It's pocket pivot breakout right here a couple weeks ago and just hanging out. Nothing really going on. No, no warning signs or anything. FLT, I think FLT is interesting. Uh, Fleet Core got a nice move today, moving higher. It had the viable gap up, pulled in once, and uh, then took off again. And that looks uh, to me kind of interesting. Uh, I thought this tightness was pretty uh, interesting this morning, and the stock is up uh, a couple of bucks. So that looks pretty good. <laughs> And you know you could try and buy it here on the basis of the Bible gap up, but you're putting yourself about 10% up, you know, up from there. But it looks fine. Look at the weekly chart. Uh, yeah, nice action going back up to the peak this morning. Let's see. Do either of you trade currencies? No. 
Please comment opine on PCYC. I guess, you know, that's kind of the wrong terminology because you don't really opine on stock. You just evaluate them. But that was a breakout here. I guess you call this a viable gap up, and they came out with earnings, and it's going higher. Nothing really much to think there. It's just moving. When you run your daily resets of your watch list, how many typically do you have? Or is there a minimum threshold of RS, EPS you use? My watch lists are basically... Um, Uh, the composite rating stocks, all stocks with a composite rating over uh, 85. Uh, so, you know, you could use IBD 50, you could use 85, 85 index. I don't really reset my watch list. They're uh, pretty much just all the stocks uh, that I pulled out. I run a screen uh, for all stocks with an 85 composite rating or higher. And then from there, I'm able to uh, sift out the ones I like, and then I'm running probably a watch list of about 60, 70 stocks. And it can it can increase or decrease uh, depending on what I add or throw out. But you know, there's no really daily reset of my list. EXP is trying to break out. Someone says, and uh, it is breaking out. So you know, there's really no buy points in here though. But it's acting okay. Uh, it's a lot like um, I'm trying to think. What's the uh, uh, they make uh, drywall. Um, oh heck! <laughs> USG, US Gypsum, and that's doing the same thing. So you know, FTK, Flowtech, I believe that is moving higher. Cheap stock though, but trying to come out of a base. Uh, basically, I believe it's another oil and gas machinery and equipment stock. So we've seen oil stocks moving pretty well lately, and so. Um, yeah, the whole group's acting pretty well. I wonder what that means. Why do you advocate using leveraged ETFs rather than uh, using futures contracts on the indexes? Well, if you trade equities, I think they're easy, easily accessible. And uh, Dr. K, can you answer that question? Sorry, there, there's a uh, go ahead one more time. It's probably your cheap uh, call came, No, a call came in and it's screwing something uh, up. Shut that person off. Uh, why do you advocate using leverage ETFs rather than using futures contracts on the indexes? Well, you can use either, just as long as you know the risk reward involved in any instrument you, you decide on. Yeah. So, but you know, for stock investors, uh, the ETFs are pretty accessible and they work. But yeah, you could use futures. You know, uh, our friend Ross Haber, he likes to trade futures and he does reasonably well trading S and P futures. What good sources of information do you use if you want to do some more thorough research on a stock sponsorship? Well, you can use Wanda. I think MarketSmith probably has uh, decent uh, data. Uh, you can also use Bloomberg. Uh, you can go to Yahoo Finance and you can look at the big holders. Uh, I think it's a little harder though on those systems because they don't show updated. Uh, I think Yahoo's reasonable, but the format isn't such that you can see who's unloading and who's buying that easily. But I think that. Uh, just to get an idea of, of who owns it and whether they're in general moving into the stock or not is uh, is critical. You know, if they if a fund a smart fund has started buying the stock say three quarters ago, and uh, they've been building their position say over the last uh, quarter every quarter, that's usually a good sign uh, that they're moving into it. Uh, here's one from our friend Dave. Eccles. Uh, Gil, do you have any ideas on why gold and silver are so weak in this QE environment? That is a really good question, and I've wondered about that as well. But I think what you've got going on right now uh, is uh, people are, are looking at potentially economic growth, and I guess maybe uh, that's what's going on. You know, I'm not going to uh, argue with it other than that it's coming down, and I don't own, uh, you know, other than my physical silver and gold that I own way, way down much, much, much lower and is more a currency hedge than anything else. Uh, all I have to say is it was my trade of the decade in the 2000s. It made uh, five or six times my money on that. But um, I don't really, I don't know, you know, I know somebody was pan, out panning gold and saying that it's at a, a cyclical high and that's why it's coming off. You're heading for the lows here, but you know, you're still in this big basing pattern. Who knows, maybe it, it continues to break down. Uh, I'm just looking at silver there. Here's gold gapping down. And either that or nobody loves it now, and this is where you want to buy buy the stuff. So I don't know, but I'm not I'm not really going to step in and buy any of these until I see a buy point, right, Dr. K? Did you yes, hear me? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Um, you know this. 
it's interesting because they're all they're all um, you know breaking through the uh, recent support. The SLV is well, it's close close to support at this point. Yeah. Um, and you know, this, they're still in their basing patterns. That's all that really needs to be said. You know, yeah, and you know they get panned out in, for when they uh, complete. You could test these lows, you know, but there's really nothing really to think in terms of, of the way we look at it because you would need to see a buy point. But someone does point out that strength in the dollar, let's say the DXA zero, uh, strength in the dollar might be pushing it down. But in, in fact, the dollar has been mostly weak, and it seems like the gold and silver have been weak along with the dollar. But interestingly, uh, lately you see dollar rallying, so maybe that's pushing it down. But I think as the uh, comments out this morning, panning uh, the metals, I think was mostly the, the issue. So I guess we'll just have to see uh, how these pan out. But you don't have to worry about it. There are no buy points. Um, somebody points out that you can go to NASDAQ.com and look up by symbol institutional holders, changes, but the time lag is slow for updates quarterly and no short positions included. Yeah, I've noticed that. Uh, Bloomberg has the best data for uh, sponsorship. So, but you know, you also just kind of want to see whether institutions are moving in or, or not. And you know, just like take an example of LinkedIn, for example. You know, we noted that, and I, and I even pointed this out when I was on TV last Thursday morning, the day of LinkedIn's earnings, uh, that you've seen the funds over the last four quarters go from 411 to 821. So it's basically double. So you can kind of pick up, you know, what's going on here. So I love the way they bring the market in to make it look like it's reversing, get everybody scared, and then they're probably going to turn them back to the upside. To me, the market, because it resists wanting to come down, it seems to me that it's just coiling, 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 and this has got to lead to some sort of a sharp move, and I'm hoping it's up up because we're mostly we've been pretty much all long here. So on assignment, well, remember, we never really cared much for the stock because it's a thinner stock, 418,000 shares a day. So you have a gap down move on heavy volume. I'm sure Dr. K would say just get rid of the stock. Right, Dr. Yeah, K? Yeah. When right when you know at the open there, look where it opened and you just want to sell it and look where it is in it's at now. You know, there's a lot of downside momentum. Yes, our our uh, webinar comic says gold has has John Paulson bent over the desk. So he's been buying it, I think, uh, pretty heavily, and uh, I guess you know, maybe that's him dumping it now. I don't know. But uh, I think that uh, you know you're just uh, it's just coming down and it still hasn't formed a bottom and it's not turning yet. So there's really not too much to think about. Anyway, so uh, any more questions? It, you know, there I notice there are fewer questions. Uh, in Vincent's is not a short. Someone's asking, uh, but I think it speaks to the fact that it, it's kind of a quiet environment. It, it, things are just kind of hanging out a little bit steady. Uh, and the market's maybe setting up to go higher. That's what, what it looks like, but we'll see. I'm, I'm surprised nobody's asked us about ruckus. You know, I, I never like this. You know, straight down, comes down, straight back up. Come out with earnings, they get whacked. And not fin stock, so you know, it's still it's very dangerous. But I'm surprised nobody asked us about this. Lumber liquidators is just continuing to go higher. You know, you had a pocket pivot here. We reported on that, and it's just continued to move higher since then. I think did they come out with earnings yet? No, haven't come out. I think that's next mm -hmm. week. It's coming. Yeah, that's the. It, they are definitely due. So that, DHI, uh, you know all the, all the builders. DHI, you had a viable gap up here. You had another. Uh, wasn't a pocket pivot, but it did try to go higher. Now it's drifting in. But I think all all the builder builders look the same. You know, Lennar bounce off of its 50-day. Pulte bounce off uh, a little above a, a little bit above the 50-day. Rylands another one. So all the builders had. Uh, bounces off the 50-day, which is uh, what you would expect. Looks normal, and uh, you know, next week you've got a bunch of housing data coming in, so that's probably what's going to drive uh, the stocks higher. If in fact the data is good, so uh, Urban Outfitters. This is one of my daughter's favorite stores. Uh, it's bouncing off the 50-day moving average. It's not a stock that we've really favored, but it's acting okay, and it's a more expensive. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, store, I think, targeted to, to early 20s, and my daughter thinks she's 25, I think, now, even though she's only 13. She spends money like a 25 year old. But, anyways, uh, she likes it and it looks okay. So, you're just getting a bounce off the 50 day moving average. I don't see anything really wrong with the stock. Earnings up 21%. I think, though, um, for my money, I like Coors better. Uh, 
129 percent earnings growth. I think Core is also uh, has potential for uh, expansion in Asia, and as we know, the Asians are the only people left with any money on the planet. So at least money they don't have to print in mass. Lithium Motors, uh, LAD, LAD, coming out with earnings next week. Stock is moving off the 10-day moving average. Uh, it might be on track for a pocket pivot. It hasn't been a stock that we favored, though. But it's acting okay. So, you know, you might get a pocket pivot today. Keep an eye on that. So, it's uh, let's see. We're almost through the hour now, Dr. K. Um, any other last questions? You know, we're just kind of hanging out watching some of these stocks. I think that... Uh, where you see stocks getting support, uh, that's normal, I think, on pullbacks. And we're still watching this DDD coming down, heading for the 50-day. It's at the 10-week right now, so see if this thing holds. This PRLB, I'm watching it just keep drifting lower. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what will happen. The stock, they'll, they'll drive you out, and then it'll turn around and just jack to the upside uh, on, on uh, some morning, and, and you will be out of the stock, I guess. But it just keeps drifting down, drifting down. And uh, I think it's because it's a thin stock, and they must have gotten everybody shaken up with uh, with uh, the uh, Citron report yesterday. I guess you know I don't know um, any other news on the stock. I don't really see it. So, but we'll see where it stabilizes in here. Uh, but you know I'm willing to take a little position here and see what happens. Just hang out. I'm not I don't think you're taking too much risk here. It's at least not at this point. Sometimes sitting is the best way. Uh, is the best way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, take your positions and watch your stops and, and just operate that way and don't get too carried away uh, one way or the other. So, uh, I'm watching cores taking off and DJI is doing pretty well here. Let's see what else. Anything else? Uh, hmm. Hmm. No, I think we pretty much covered it. Any last questions before we sign off? I think uh, I'm watching for the market to turn and go higher here, so that's what I'm looking for. How about you, Dutch K? Uh, yeah, that's um, essentially, you know, there's not much to be said. Yeah. Netflix. Everybody wants to know about Netflix. Um, I don't know. That you had a gap up here. We didn't think it was viable. You know, it looked kind of like you could have gone after it when I saw that, but it's way extended now. I'm not a buyer of Netflix. I'm certainly not going to short the yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, you have a lot of risk buying these bottom feeder type stocks. I mean, for everyone that does what Netflix did, there's a lot that don't. So you know, again, it's an odds game. So I wouldn't touch these kinds of names. Yeah. Anyways, I predict Cores is going through 70 soon, and uh, so you just want to hang out there. It's acting well today, so. And that's pretty much all we have. Oh, one last thing. Yeah, Dr. K, let's do a, you want to do an update on the VIX? What's your favorite uh, VIX ETF? Really not much going on here. As long as the market goes up, I don't see this thing turning. So what's yeah, your take? Well, a, there's a general downside bias, as I've said before, on UVXY and VXX. And, uh, you know, as long as the market continues to trend, these will, these will head lower. Yeah, so there's really nothing there. So the VIX, your VIX model is on a sell signal. Right now, and that's pretty much yeah, all there is. It's been for a while now. Let's take a look. Just in closing, I'm watching these come down, and I'm like getting ready to pull the trigger on these. But you're seeing this thing coming on, coming down, coming down. This is Proto Labs, and you get this sort of a downside move. No volume here. It just seems like they're scaring people out. I'd be looking for this thing to turn around. But what I'd wait for maybe is a turn. If you want to try and get aggressive here on a buy, look for some sort of a turn with the the six period exponential moving back up to the 20 period. That's a possibility. I'm watching 3D off of the 50-day uh, moving average. Now notice this, you came down once and now you're retesting the lows of the day and maybe it turns. So, you know, when I'm looking at stocks coming down and thinking about taking a position, I will use a five-minute chart to time it intraday because if you do get a turn, you'll definitely see uh, this sort of action. You know, you had that yesterday. Um, I think other days where you've had turns, same thing, and and so it does kind of give you some reference point because when you're trying to catch these things coming down, it's difficult uh, to to have a reference point where you come in and where you're pushed out if it doesn't work. So, you know, that, and and that's basically for intraday type action. I use that mostly on the short side, but it might it might uh, sometimes I'll use it for for these stocks. You know, looking at them uh, when they're coming in.
Somebody asked, do you ever use intraday strategy to trade earnings reports? No. Is Apple working on its right shoulder? We talked about Apple, and, and uh, it's these. this is the right shoulder. These were the right shoulders in the pattern. If you look at this, this is your um, head and shoulders formation. Where's my handy dandy pencil? And you have a neckline here, basically, roughly. And you see it breaks down. So this is the left shoulder. There's a head. Here's the right shoulder. This is not a, a right shoulder. At this point, you're... You broke into the downside. You rallied up towards the 10-week line and the 50-day, or and the neckline rather, uh, and you haven't been able to get past it. So you might be setting up to go lower. I do think though that you're going to have to see um, some volume, or, or at least the market get into some trouble before uh, Apple becomes a short. And what I'm noticing here is you're holding the 10-day line and, and selling is uh, declining. And as I pointed out, you might have one, uh, two, three waves down. Uh, or you might look one, two, and then three here, but it, it looks like you're starting to get sold out. And like I pointed out earlier in the webinar, we saw the report yesterday from uh, you know about the, all these big hedge fund managers uh, unloading their stock uh, in Apple, and so now maybe everybody's out, and now you're in a position for, to get a reflex rally. But you know it has been relatively weak compared to the market, and uh, doesn't look doesn't look viable, but I'm not so sure you're going to be able to make money shorting it. Anyways, that's it for uh, today, you guys. Thanks for all the questions. Um, and I would point out if, if you guys have a preference in days, you know, we scheduled today because it's been a very quiet week and we just thought it would be better to review the action uh, at the end of the week. If, if there's a day you think is more uh, impactful, shall we say, uh, then let us know and we might try and schedule like either earlier in the week or later in the week. So. Somebody likes, people say they like Fridays. So I think it's a good review of what's going on for the week and uh, get you set up for next week. Anyways, that's all I've got. Thanks for showing up, you guys. Catch you next time. Take care, everyone.